Welcome to the Resume Storyteller, bringing you interviews with industry experts, regular folks who tested the job search waters and succeeded, and strategies to tell your story and land you job interviews. Here's your host, Virginia Franco. Hey guys, I have with me executive resume writer, career and interview uh, coach, Kathy Lanzalaco. Uh, Kathy is a the CEO of Inspire Careers, which is a full-service career marketing firm based in Buffalo, New York, who serves job seekers across the country. Inspire Careers specializes in career launches for new college grads and career marketing strategies for execs and career-minded professionals, so the whole spectrum. As a three-time career changes, changer with over 18 years of experience in human resources, Kathy provides insights and strategies that help her clients land jobs and create careers they love in less time than going it alone. Um, Kathy, we've known each other now for a couple of years. I um, I love your business. I love what you share on LinkedIn. So thank you so much for coming on this podcast. Hey, thanks so much, Virginia, for inviting me. Um, I'm just so, so honored to be here today. I love what you're doing. I love Job Search Journey. I am just so excited to be here. Well, thank you. So you heard me share a really brief bite about your own story, but I would love to hear about what prompted you to come into the career space and become the CEO of Inspire Careers. Well, as you had mentioned on the introduction, um, I have a three-time career changer. My first career was as a registered nurse, and I worked in hospital nursing and hospital leadership for 15 years, and then I transitioned into human resources. And I had what I call my big fat HR job. I was mm-hmm. doing that for a long time, running a, an HR department, and I absolutely loved it. But like so many people that may be listening to this, uh, my job went away one day. They closed the business that I supported. And while I thought I was going to end my career there, that was not the case. And I loved that job. And I knew that I really couldn't replicate it anywhere else. And because I'd already switched careers once, I knew that I could do something else. And I really wanted to take what I had learned in HR and pick out the the best parts of it for me, things I really enjoyed. And I knew that I wasn't really big into compliance and those, you know, paper pushing with HR. That's a necessary evil of it. It it happens, you know, it has to be. But I loved the coaching. And as an HR leader, I did a lot of executive coaching and just kind of skim the service surface with resume writing, but a lot of the coaching piece. So that's when I said, you know what, I think there's more I can do here. And I took a couple short term HR jobs. And then one day I said, you know what, I'm just going to jump all in. And I got certified as a resume writer, certified as a career coach, started doing some subcontracting and just learning, learning, learning until one day I said, I have to make a choice. I have to either decide I'm going to do this or not. And I walked away from my full-time job and that was in 2018 and I've been doing it ever since. Wow. I love that you weren't intimidated by the idea of doing it again because you've done it before. Yeah, but you know what? I would love to tell you how brave I was. <laughs> I think a lot of it was ignorance, to be honest with you. You know, I, I had just come out of that the terrible time and anybody again that's been through that just knows how devastating it is and how you just question everything about yourself so I just figured what have I got to lose I just lost my big job I just lost what I thought was my future you know for my career what what's the worst thing that could happen and right yeah well and then the rug gets pulled out yeah and the rug gets and I mean that's you know during crises have a way of making people make these kinds of bigger moves as we saw during COVID. I, you know, for me, it was the recession. Um, and for you, it was having the the rug pulled out from under you when your big plan for your career totally, you know, changed in the span of a day, it sounds like. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing is, and I, I don't know how many other people feel this too, or, you know, if this weighed into your decision to start your own business, but I didn't want anybody controlling my destiny anymore. Like I really didn't set out to be a business owner, but I knew that I didn't want anyone to have that kind of power over my life anymore. Mm. So that's when I said, you know, I can do whatever I want it, as much as I want. It depends on my success, depends on how much I put into it. Am I smart enough? Am I capable enough? Well, I wasn't really sure, but I figured I could I could work hard 
And then things have a way of coming together and you just learn more every day. You do something a little different. You try things, you take some risk, but I, I want to be in control. I just don't want anybody else to have that power over me. And so that was your deal breaker. It sounds like mm -hmm. um, so I'm like you, I was a total accidental entrepreneur. Um, for me, my deal breaker was I do not want to pay the exorbitant amount of childcare at that point. Three of my four kids mm -hmm. needed full-time childcare and one was in elementary school. So that I had to, I was very clear on that piece and that was about it. Um, mm -hmm. The rest, I was sort of making it up as I went along. Yeah. And I, I tell you though, you know, as I said before, I think some of it was pure ignorance on my part. And, you know, there's a lot to, to be said for if you knew then what you know now, but I'll tell you that when you don't know enough, you know, you just ask a lot of questions and you don't have any ceremony to stand on. You just ask everybody for, you know, you, the questions that you have and you try things and you make a lot of mistakes, but boy, do you learn a lot. And it has been very rewarding. So I would never do it again. And I would never work for someone else again. Partnerships well, great. But, absolutely. Yeah. And what I also love is that message that you don't, you don't have to have it all figured out, right? You're, we're, we're, we figured it out as we went along. Yeah which is yeah. more than okay. Um, well, and so the, one of the big reasons I wanted to have you on as a guest and why I was so excited is I wanted to talk about job search challenges facing uh, people that are my age, your age, or more Gen Xers, some younger baby boomers, and maybe even older millennials that given that both you and I have made big career changes. Um, and we did so at an age when a lot of people are worried about doing that right there like oh i'm too old for this um so i you know i'd love to just i have a couple questions for you and i'd love to sort of dive in within the context of that that uh conversation yeah let's go let's have mm -hmm. some fun with it so what i know you work with all ages new grads all the way up to um to older folks what are sort of common challenges that you see facing the the more senior job seekers, the Gen Xers, older millennials, that group, and younger baby boomers. Yeah. Well, I think the number one thing is that terrible word ageism, because it's really mm -hmm. not what it really is, is age discrimination. But the way I view that is it's two challenges in itself. It's the misconceptions and the stereotypes that employers have about mature workers. And then it's also what mature workers think about themselves. And sometimes, honestly, I think that's more of a barrier to success. When I talk to job seekers that are in their late 40s, even, and I, I would even tell you that some of them in their early 40s will tell me that they think that they're getting too old to be looking for different jobs. But I also work with people. I've had a number of people come out of retirement this year to get back into the job search. Um, and, you know, so people, let's even stick in that mid 50 year old range or so. And a lot of times the barriers are in people's heads. They feel as if other people aren't going to want what they have to offer. And they're not really sure what they have to offer beyond 20 years of experience or 30 years. So, you know, they don't really know what that means. So I think it's getting beyond the games that go on in our own head, but then also realizing what those stereotypes are and what the external barriers are too, so that you can just address them head on and bring them down. So what are the misconceptions or stereotypes that you feel are most prevalent about mature workers? Yeah, I think the leading one is technology. I think yeah. there's the assumption, yeah, wouldn't you agree? The assumption that older workers are not technologically savvy, that they can't pick up new concepts quickly, that everybody's working on their old typewriter at home and that they don't know how to mm -hmm. do things. When in fact, that's not the case. And particularly if you're talking about Gen Xers and the older millennials, they absolutely are totally in that sweet spot, you know, where they grew up with, with, word processing and they just came, you know, came up with that. But even I'm 59 years old and, you know, I know everybody that I know on a professional level, our tech skills have never been better. And in our minds, you know, we know who we are now. We know what questions to ask. We know what our strengths are. We know where our softer spots are. So I think that's the leading misconception. And then 
course, you know, you always get into the, what do I have to pay you? Am I going to have to pay you for your experience and so forth? Right. But I think it's really that skills piece. But I will tell you the other thing that I share with my clients is I think they're also afraid of what, what the impression will be in the workplace, meaning there's a lot of differences that we're seeing in these different generational levels about um, about the way people work. I don't want to say work ethic because it's just interpreted differently to say that young people don't have a good work ethic. I, I think that's that's um, it's not accurate. I think they just work differently and they have different expectations. Yeah, it's I just saw a study um, that was, you know, slamming Gen Z yeah. and the, the complaints were the exact same that I have heard for <laughs> that I remember hearing about my generation by the older one, every generation, whatever the new one is to the workplace, it seems like the same complaints show up. Um, But what I, what is, I think maybe good about, or beneficial about the misconceptions and stereotypes about, you know, things like being tech savvy and that you don't pick things up quickly is that you can overcome those. Mm -hmm pretty easily on paper directly. You can speak to software you use or tools you use. You can speak to adapting to new processes, new environments um, in as part of your storytelling, right? And so that immediately sort of heads that misconception off at the path, I think. Mm-hmm. You're absolutely right. But that also goes back to the part two of that, you know, that I said, I think a lot of the barriers are in their heads. So I think yes. that's the problem is how do they arrange that in their heads to tell those stories well, to tell them in a very compelling manner, instead of sounding like they're apologizing and to be right. able to say, no, I'm at the top of my game. Really, you're lucky you're getting me now because this is really the best I've ever been based on what I have learned, how I've adapted how I've been mentored, who I've mentored, the successes I've had, the failures I've had, you know, how I've learned from them. So I think it's it's really finding the balance between the two. No, I agree with that. I just, um, someone was writing an article and they um, tagged me and I got to weigh in on, uh, I don't know if you were on that thread or not, but it was what what is unique about more mature job seekers. And to me, the fact that they're on the top of their game, but also because they, it's not the fact that they've had 20 plus years of experience, but they have been there, done that. You're not going to be able to shake them as much because they have been through so many ups and downs. Um, and in today's rocky environment, I feel like that's appealing to have someone that's not going to panic at a moment's notice because they've they've seen things happen. Yeah, you're place. so right. And I think what else that goes to talk about is, you know, this whole how many years of experience do I have? Experience means nothing. And I do yeah. think that people rely on that. I, I That's something that I have to talk about with my clients to say it's not about the experience. It's about what that experience has taught you. And to be able to say, just like you're talking about, been there, done that. I've lived through all of these ups and downs. And so I am much more emotionally prepared, you know, to handle these things that are happening. You know, I anticipate them versus getting shocked by them, right? That's what experience really right, leads exactly. to. Right, mm-hmm. exactly. Very good. No, I love that. So let's say someone comes to you and they are thinking about launching a job search. What do you, what do you, how do you recommend they get started? A lot of people just come and go, I'm job searching, I need a resume. And <laughs> They sort of think of that as that first step. What do you think? say? Yeah, well, I'm very big on preparation. And it's just like so many other things in life, the more work you put in on the front end of it, you know, or on the back end of it, that, um, you know, the, the actual execution of it will go so much smoother. And I'm a yeah. big list maker. I'm a big worksheet kind of coach. Like I, I think there's a lot of value in writing things out. So when I tell people, you know, they come to me and say, well, I need a resume. Well, what do you need it for? What is your plan? You know, and generally the plan is, well, I need to start applying. Well, let's take a step back and think about laying that foundation. And what I first do with my clients is to identify what they're looking for in that next job. Let's talk about why you want to leave your current job. 
you know, is what is it about that that's unsatisfying right now? Or maybe you're not unsatisfied, but there's no more room for growth. Maybe leadership right. is changing. Maybe there's a buyout. Who knows what it is? But all of these things go into factor about why you're having the job search. And then we start talking about the targeting um, of companies and targeting. And we do talk about titles because that's critically important and that's the way that people apply for jobs, but really helping them understand that there's so much more than just merely throwing your resume up on a job board. And really the more that you can figure out in the beginning will help you target the right opportunities, save you a lot of time and really, and they don't see this all the time in the beginning, but it will have the ability to accelerate the search as it goes on. So what are you running from and what are you running to? Being yeah. crystal clear on that. Mm -hmm. What about the person who, and you probably actually sort of already answered this, but what about that person that comes to you and they've been job searching for six months? Like nothing's working. How how do you help them to figure out how to how to re-engage or re reinitiate things? Yeah. Well, a lot of times it's about first is kind of putting out the the panic fire because usually by that time people are like, oh, nothing's working. And then of course I ask how many, you know, what are, what is your strategy? And generally, if you've been searching six months and you've submitted 200 applications, that tells me you don't have a strategy. So it's really about the good news is. Yeah, I know the bad news is that you've been doing this for six months, but the good news is it's easy to change. There is a strategy. There is a way to press the reset button and move on a different path because just applying for jobs over and over again without success is not the best way to conduct a job search. And that's generally what people think a job search is, but it really is so much more. And you know, to your point is you you ask them what their what was their strategy. And it might be that. They're, they're getting a bunch of interviews, but it's not going well. And then that tells mm -hmm. you, well, then your resume is probably working, right? Then maybe you need some support in this next stage of job search, which is interviewing. There's, I feel like there's lots of places where job search can go awry. Um, yep. But by asking what the strategy is, you're figuring out where that bottleneck is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point, because I do hear that a lot as well is that people are getting that interviews. But you know, it's really interesting because I a lot of people will say to me, I'm a great interviewer. I really thought I had that job. I was surprised when they didn't offer it to me. Mm -hmm. You know, so then you say, well, let's kind of talk about the format of the interview and really where that disconnect is. And how are you communicating your value? And are you still relying on interview processes from years ago instead of really understanding the state of work today and what these companies are really looking for and what their pain points are that can be a real game changer when you get to that stage no oh, really good point um what about sort of sort of the third scenario that i i see a lot of i'm sure you do too that person who is trying to figure out their target and they say you know i'm really good at all these things and i I, I'm open, you know, I'm quote unquote open. I don't want to, I don't want to limit myself by, um, by picking or choosing what, what are your thoughts on that? And how do you, how do you advise those kinds of job seekers? Yeah, well, I think that can be really exciting, but I think that can also be really confusing. Um, so what I, I tell those people is that, yes, I believe that you absolutely have a huge diverse skill set, but the question is, what do you really want to do? You can do a lot of things, but what do you really want to do? And a lot of that focuses on trying to get them to be able to articulate where that intersection comes between their passion, their zone of genius, their experience, to be able to say, this is what I do best. This is probably what I'm going to enjoy more. This is what's going to allow me to make the most money, if that's their priority. Um, maybe they have different priorities. So we all have, you know, have to figure that out based on where all of those things intersect. But targeting, having a target for a job for uh, the next stage of your career is so much more productive than just throwing darts all over the place. But I do believe that there is a, a bucket for exploration. You know, after you create your target list of companies and target for the type of jobs that really are within your wheelhouse. And that means meeting all the criteria, including enjoying that job. Then I do think that there's some time that you when you have nothing to lose that you can just apply for some other jobs if you want to have some fun with that. But the major activities should really be focused around where all of those elements intersect 
And that's where they're going to be able to find the best return on their investment okay. of their time. So I love that intersection between zone of genius, your passion and your priorities, because there's things you're good at that you don't necessarily love to do. And it's also based on where you are in your life, right? What you, yeah. your priorities in your twenties might be different than your forties or your fifties. Yeah. Um, I hadn't thought about that bucket of exploration where you're saying you could still go have one-off conversations with someone in this, in this job um, that potentially interests you and see what it's like and, you know, throw a resume out there applying online, but don't make it be your, your full-time focus. Is that, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Because if you really do want to make a switch, you know, the, the, the better strategy is to find that intersection and proceed that way. But really, you know, what, what I really hear behind people saying that I have these diverse skills, I can do things is they do want to explore. They do want to see what's out there. They're testing themselves. So I do think there's an element of you can carve out maybe five or 10% of your job search time to do that. But recognizing that when you go into a completely different area, kind of switching lanes, if you will, um, mm -hmm. the money may be less. Uh, the circumstances might not be ideal. You may have to start at a different level than you're used to. But listen, if you got everything else in line and that's appealing to you, that could open up an entire different door. It's not where I see most people, you know, everybody thinks, well, I want, I could do anything and I want to do something different. Not a whole lot of people end up doing that. It's what appetite for risk do you have as well? Right, right. Um, have some fun with it because why not? You only go around once. Well, and my challenge with, with, especially when career targets are sort of just very, they're very different from each other's how to write the LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, and so I, like you, I say, well, let's, let's try to lean in on one because you don't want a confusing LinkedIn profile. Mm -hmm. If, if you are, if you are, if you've got, especially if you've got to land really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I sort of feel like you need to lean in a little bit more one way than the other, but that doesn't mean you can't have two different resumes and use it to have conversations and apply online and all of that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, with LinkedIn, too, you know, there's that featured section where, you know, those the ones that are visible, the first three that are visible, you can absolutely put what is aligning with your brand and what aligns with your job targets or the, the career that you're currently in. But I think there's probably I don't even know how many things you can put on the featured section. A lot. I think it's limited. Yeah, I don't know. I've never gotten there and I got a ton of stuff on mine. <laughs> so you can have some fun with that though, because really the name of the game today too is authenticity, right? People want to learn more about you. It's all part of your professional and personal storytelling. You can dabble a little bit in there too to let people see some other parts of your personality, what your sense of adventure is. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you can do it on there too. Why? Yeah, because that's how your that tells your full story. You're right. Yeah. But to your point, you have to still have a, a, a message and a direction for people to understand who you are and what you have to offer. So it's that balance. Right, right, right. right. You're right. No, very good point. Um, so when older job seekers are, I guess by older, I mean also people that have been, it's been a while since they've been, mm. had a job search, right? Mm -hmm. And they, um, they don't sort of know where to start in terms of creating all of the documents you need for job search, a resume, a cover letter, LinkedIn, all of that. What um, do you have any words of wisdom or advice on what what they should be looking for? Like, what do these modern documents look like now versus, you know, maybe several years ago when they were first taught to write them? Yeah. Yeah, that's isn't that like the conversation that you have every day with people? So much has changed. And when I talk to people about resumes, I use the term high performance resumes because the resume that you currently have is unlikely to be a high performance resume if it looks like a resume from 10, even 10 years ago, right? 20 years ago. And if you're 35 and you're still carrying around that career center resume, that's not a high performance resume. Yeah. Right. So it's really and I, I like people to think about it. Well, think about the the evolution of yourself personally and professionally. Your resume should come along with that. So it makes a whole lot of sense that nowadays, instead of the objective statement that we're using a branded summary statement and, you know, the idea that it used to be just a copy and paste of job postings and today's best resumes are about results and demonstrating the value that you've brought to an organization. So it just kind of makes sense if you take a step back and think about, well, how have I evolved? 
evolved? Shouldn't the vehicle for my storytelling have evolved too? And I, that's a, a lot of times helps people get there both from a resume perspective as well as LinkedIn. Oh, I love that. The other thing I always think about is I don't read the same way I used to. I mean, I used to mm. open up books, print, you yeah. know, kill a million trees. I don't <laughs> do that anymore. I'm on my phone. I'm on my laptop. Yeah, right. Um, and so technology has changed completely how we read. So it makes sense that our writing has to evolve as well. That's an excellent point because you're right. It, the resumes are probably going to be looked at by the recruiter on their phone while they're but for initially. Yeah, it might get printed out down the road, but certainly not yeah. at the beginning. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, or if you're sharing it with a friend through email and they're going to be looking right. at, it at the soccer game. Right. They have an opening right. in their place, but they're going to be doing it while they're doing their stuff. I mean, everybody. Yeah, I mean, so, 10 years awesome. ago, nobody opened a PDF on a phone. We had smartphones, I think, but <laughs> we weren't using them for that stuff. And LinkedIn, I think they, it's like. Like sixty percent of people read it on mobile, which yeah, reading stuff on mobile is really different than reading on our big screens. Yeah, yeah, such a such a great point. Um, so what are the biggest pitfalls that you see facing um facing mature workers, and what advice do you what advice can you share for you know maybe avoiding them or at least mitigating them? So that's a very well, broad I, question. Maybe one or two. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that there's a twofold answer there for me. Um, and it goes back to the first question you asked about the challenges. And so I, I associate the pitfalls similarly with, first of all, not having a strategy and saying, well, I just know that I need to do something. I need something to hold me over till retirement. I just need one more job, you know, and yeah. just saying, well, I just am going to do this without really defining what they want and what the strategy for it is. And then I say the second thing goes back to, again, the first question is about the barriers in our own head. And it is about having the belief that you can have what you want. And to be able to say, I worked this hard to get this far, I can have what I want in that next stage. I have to prepare. I may have to make an investment in it. it may take a little bit of time. It's going to have to be stretching myself a little bit, maybe to think differently than I have in the past. But the belief that I can have what I want, I just have to figure out what the strategy is to get there. Okay. So you sound like you really believe that um, we're our own worst enemies with this stuff. Well, maybe I am speaking from experience, maybe <laughs> what it is, but I think it is, you know, on my LinkedIn profile in my about section, the first line is job search success starts in the head. And I do believe that. I believe that with every area of our lives and I see it in my own business, right? When I'm up against a block or I think, oh, I want to do this. I want to change a product. I want to create a new solution. And then the issue is never about what the external competition is. It's always about what I tell myself. Can I do it? Does anybody want it? You know, am I smart enough to figure it out? And you've got to calm all those voices. We all have them. And yeah, so right. And right. imposter syndrome and uh -huh. um, something fear that it's too, too hard or too hard to take on. You're right. Everyone has them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And heck, if you've gotten to be 40, 50, 60 or more years old and you've raised a family, is there any more greater challenge than that? Right. Yeah. You're right. We've been through so much. Um, but you take it for granted that it was easy because you did it when nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes it's about asking other people, you know, what do you think about me? Or, you know, what what is the first thing that comes to mind when you think about me? And, and of course, we all have to make our own decisions. We can't listen to what other people always say. But the people in our circle of trust, the people that we love and that know us best, you know, are likely to give us more candid feedback and it'll speak to us if it's true. We'll already know it's true once we hear it. And then you can kind of put the pieces together. Yeah, 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 I know. I love that. That's really empowering. Um, so what are, so let's say someone comes to you uh, at a dinner party and I actually just had this happen to me over the weekend. Someone said, uh, I might, my, my, nephew is getting ready to job search what are what what are two tools that that person needs to have in order to to initiate their job search or their career change what would you say those are well beyond the the mindset piece it really is the high yeah. performance resume they have to have a resume targeted towards the the career target that they have and a, a linkedin profile it's just not a nice to have anymore you have to have it 
And mm -hmm. that's because two reasons. One is that once you're applying for jobs, the recruiter is going to go to your LinkedIn profile. They're going to want to confirm your information. They're going to want to learn more about you. And to not have that ability, they may go to somebody else if they can't really validate who you are and learn more about you to determine if you're going to be a good fit. Should they even pick up the phone? And also a well-written, fully optimized profile should be bringing opportunities into you. And so not to do that is losing a whole additional arm of your strategy. So those are the absolute two musts that people have to have to start a job search at any level, any age. Well, and I get the argument quite a bit from people. I hate social media. I don't want LinkedIn. And uh, I just like what you said, it is no longer a nice to have. Um, it is Someone will, they're going to look for you. And if they don't see you, they're going to, they're going to fill in the blank with stuff that might not be accurate. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're also losing the opportunity to be found, which yeah. is just short-sighted. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that that's such a great point, Virginia. When you talk about, I, I hear that every day too. I don't like social media. You know, people have got to get that statement out of their vocabulary. Yeah. Um, or even the younger, because I work with a lot of new college grads, and they'll be like, well, you know, uh, I don't really like LinkedIn, well, because they're on Instagram, TikTok, or they're doing right, their right, thing. Right. Well, you know, transfer that passion, though, there's a way that you can still express yourself on LinkedIn for that. That's and true. whether or not, yeah, and whether or not we agree with it, it doesn't really matter. It is here, and to ignore it, right. you quit fighting the functionality it, yeah. is, yeah, you're just cutting down your search. Yeah, limiting yourself is probably the better. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So you have done, you've launched several exciting programs this year. Um, I'd love to hear what um, what is next for you in 2023, because we're getting now into the last quarter of 2022. Um, what what exciting things can you share that are coming down the pike with Inspire Careers? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, actually, uh, yeah, it is crazy, right? Q4 already, can't believe it. Um, but what I am planning on 2023 is two things. One is to expand my teachable offerings. In 2022, I started a teachable school. So for um, people that either wanted supplements to working with me or people that weren't ready for the financial investment of working with me, but liked my style, wanted to learn from me, but not at that at a one-to-one -one level. Right. I have a school where I have um, I teach resume writing. The people can do write their own resume, and I help them do that on on a, a course on my Teachable School. I have one for interview, one for job search, one for salary negotiation, and so in 2023, I'm going to be using that to expand my new college grad program and to be able to take that program and put that on um, a kind of more of a do-it-yourselfer uh, approach for those again okay. that are so sort of a self-paced self-paced yeah. uh diy for the college for yep. for new grads yeah because i have the inspire career student professional launch right. program which is tremendous and has just taken off far beyond what I would have anticipated it would have done. And I have so much demand for it that I do believe there's another audience for the, the self-paced method to do that. So I, I'm really excited about that because these new grads, they just, they're so, they're such sponges. They're so great. They're so excited to learn. Um, but there is like a huge learning curve, right, coming out. And a lot of them have still been impacted by COVID with no internships different learning experiences that they're still, you know, trying to overcome. So that's happening in 2023. And, um, and that's a couple of things, but that's the one I'm most excited about right now. I'm so excited. Gosh. And, um, that, that group learns so quickly. Oh, they I, do. I mean, yeah, yeah, they do. And they ask great questions because they don't have, I agree. you know, cause they're not, I don't, maybe it's not the right thing to say, but, you know, I think the older you get, you start caring a little bit more about what people think. And then you don't, you know, you get all this stuff going on in your head again, but these kids, they're just like, they just say what they think. Help me understand. I don't yeah, know. That's right. Good or bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they're not afraid to admit they don't know something. Whereas, you know, sometimes as we get a little bit older, we don't want people to think we don't know you're everything. Right. right. You're right. You're right. No, you're absolutely right. 
Um, well, Kathy, if people want to learn more about you, follow you, I have shared your LinkedIn profile, um, your website, inspirecareers.com, and also your email. Are, are those the three best places to connect with you? Or are there any others that you want to share? No, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I'm on LinkedIn all day long. So um, that's a really easy place to find me, but the other ones are great. Reach out directly. I'm really happy to schedule a, a complimentary com conversation and just see how I can help. Thank you. Thank you so much. You have, I, I feel like you have shared lots of great takeaways that people can go and apply right away and really to help get their mindset set, set mindset set, um, <laughs> which is, you know, half the battle. Yes, and it is. Thank you. It is absolutely half the battle. And I guess if we can all get past that, then there's nothing any of us can't do. Love that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Virginia, for inviting me. You've been listening to The Resume Storyteller with Virginia Franco. To learn more about storytelling strategies to catch the eye of today's online skim hiring and decision makers, please visit www.virginiafrancoresumes.com.